uh, Michael Tall. How many of you heard or played over the games of Michael Tall? Okay. Now, that's a kind of an interesting question is like um, what people's perception of Michael Tall was. And the popular meme is that Tall was this uh, crazy guy, man. He just loved to sacrifice his pieces. And he'd just throw his pieces and pawns at you. And most of his combinations were unsound or just barely. And they were so complex and complicated, his opponent got in trouble and time trouble and problems, and uh, they collapsed. And he was like this hurricane, this force of nature. And it's interesting because that wasn't the way I saw him at all. But there was a period there where I think Michael Tall played like 80, 8-0, 80 top world-class international grandmasters and went undefeated. Well, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> did you say undefeated? I mean, isn't this the swashbuckling, debonair, you know, guy who's throwing pawns and pieces at everybody? You don't go undefeated with that type of style. This is like a rock-solid guy, you know? One of the things was that he was really, really good at combinations, okay? This made him world champion, okay? And where did this extraordinary ability at combinations come from. Okay, so in this game, Michael Tall is white, F.M. Geller, one of the world's strongest grandmasters was black. F.M. Geller, as you know, had a plus score against Bobby Fischer, so he's not a bad player, this player on the black side. This game was played in 1958 in the USSR championship, or the, cha the national championship of the Soviet Union, in round 12. And the game continued along very normal patterns of what is called, of course, the Rui Lopez, bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, knight f6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1. So we reach right now what is probably one of the most analyzed as well as most played positions of all time, the most classical variation of the king's pawn opening, the Rui Lopez. And it's very, it's very interesting, the vagaries of fashion. Today, uh, Levon Aronian, Mickey Adams and many other people love to play the martial gambit. So that, that gambit, of course, occurs. Just a second. Let me move some things around for a moment. The martial gambit, of course, occurs uh, after castles. Yes, new variation. Uh, C3, D5, pawn takes D5. Knight takes d5, and we have the gambit made most famous by Frank Marshall. Okay, today a lot of players like to play black, uh, black side. Uh, do you all know uh, the myth, the, the story behind the Marshall gambit? Yeah, you, you know it, Julian? What's, what's the version you know? Yes, that's correct. So first of all, Frank Marshall in the 1900s, 1930s was one of America's greatest players, uh, American champion, and he played uh, in the world's elite players. And it was very common for him. In fact, that's what he did. He's, he went to bed and then on his bedside table, he had a little notebook and a pencil. And uh, very oftentimes he had dreams about chess. And he would wake up and realize that he had an idea and that was why he had the notebook. So he would quickly scribble 
uh, his idea upon waking up. And so he had this position in his mind, and uh, he began a series for many years to play the black side of the position. Now today, the modern way of playing the martial gambit is to play c6, maintaining the knight on d5, and after d4, bishop d6, rook e1, queen h4. We have many, many, many moves of the martial gambit still to go. So that's the modern day treatment. Well, Frank Marshall had a completely different idea than maintaining his knight here. Instead, he dropped his knight back to f6 with a completely different idea in mind. What his idea was that is he wanted to put his bishop on d6, attack this rook, force the rook to go back, sacrifice his bishop on h2, and after king takes h2, play knight g4, and so on. And he analyzed this whole idea in secret for years. And he sprang it on the world champion Jose Raul Capablanca. And Capablanca <coughs> literally spent about an hour in this position. The game continued, and the world champion Capablanca refuted Marshall's idea over the board. I mean, dull. <laughs> That's just terrible, right? You know, you spent years preparing an idea, and the guy was so good, he found the proper anecdote. Anyway, the vagaries of, of, of chess theory are like fashion, and they come and go. But at the time of this game, by far the most played move was simply d7, d6, not going for the martial gambit, c3, castles. And then at times, this move, d4, becomes popular. Uh, the idea of d4, many, many games go d4, bishop, g4, and d5, and knight here, and so forth and so on. And after h3, excuse me, whoops, uh, sorry, c6, uh, h3, bishop c8. Tons of games have been played like this, and the overall viewpoint is, is that black is doing fine, and so the move d4, uh, not the main move, is replaced by the main move, h3. So in this position, again, we're still in chess theory that goes for many, many moves from here. In the 18th and 19th century, uh, there was the guy Chigorin, and this was Chigorin's move, knight a5. The idea is that the knight on c6 inhibits the pawn on c7, so the knight moves so that the pawn can advance and the knight moves with a tempo against the bishop. So all of these moves once again have been played and in this position there's a ton of moves. Uh, original Chikorin idea of, of returning the knight to c6, Smyslov's queen c7, there's knight d7, and again at the time that this game was played in 1958, uh, bishop d7 was very popular. So, uh, there's many approaches to this position. I'd encourage you uh, to read Bobby Fischer's My 60 Memorable Games, as Bobby himself uh, will, will explain all about what happens when you capture the pawn and knight takes e5. Uh, the whole idea is that capturing this pawn, in the words of Walter Brown, immediately does not benefit white. After knight, after queen takes d8, rook takes d8, knight takes e5. Mm -hmm. The idea is that this pawn on e4, which looks like it's very nicely protected, in fact is not. Black can ta capture on e4, takes, 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 and oops. There's a check at the end of the line, and 
nice double attack against the knight. And, but bishop d6 check, and black is doing excellently. Yeah? Okay. So if the pawn on e5 isn't hanging after the move bishop b7, one thing that white can consider is closing the position with the move d5. And that's a whole different branch of theory. Um, in this game, b4 was played, and that was popular at the time. Takes, takes, knight here, knight d2. Okay. So we're still in theory, and there's a lot of uh, possibilities here for black uh, of what he might play or what he might consider. But at that time, the uh, theory suggested d5, right? Boom, you know, blowing up. Look at this, look at this explosiveness in the center. Uh, all the pawns can capture one another. And uh, the, consid the uh, considered opinion of the theorists at that time was that black was doing just fine in this position. And with this move, d5, by the way, <coughs> black is opening up this bishop on e7 that is otherwise a little bit passive. And this bishop looks terrific. So in short, Geller's a happy camper. Okay. Takes on d5. Takes on d4. Takes, 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 takes. OK. So. Uh, Black's happy, right? Black's happy. Uh, in Black's mind, he's ready to play queen takes d5, winning a pawn. The rook is under fire. And what is white going to do? Uh, what this game, for me, was about was this extraordinary ability to ignore the opponent's threat. In other words, to impose what you want to do on your opponent. Uh, you ignore your opponent's threat, and you create threats of your own. This is an extraordinary example of literally imposing your will on the position. Rook b1, attacking the bishop. Julian. Yes, bishop g5 is an excellent move as well. Bishop g5, pinning the knight to the queen, basically bishop take, well, let's have a look. So we can see what, what Julian has in mind. Let me see. I actually want, oops, sorry. I actually want to hide. How do I? Ben, how do I hide uh, the notation? Training. Training. Good. <laughs> <laughs> he asked a simple question, get a simple answer. OK, so we've sacrificed an exchange. And now, uh, this is a line that undoubtedly Michael Tall had to analyze. He had to weigh uh, the scales here. He sees that bishop takes f6 uh, well first of all he's an exchange down is he a pawn down no he hasn't he hasn't yet he sees that bishop takes f6 that that's a very nasty pin and he calculates something like queen takes d5 bishop takes f6 queen takes d4 bishop takes d4 bishop takes f3 g takes f3 and he's satisfied with his position uh, he sees something like bishop takes d5, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, queen h4 with a nice deadly threat against the pawn on h7, and once more he's satisfied with his position. But then he starts to wonder how effective, how good is the exchange sacrifice 
is if black plays a move like queen d6, getting out of our pin. Are we going to play bishop takes, queen takes, and queen takes? Um, is a pawn sufficient for the exchange? He's not so sure, but he takes this position, what Julian, you've asked about, and he asks himself a, a different question. What in that position that we were just looking at for a moment, if instead of having a rook on e1, we had a rook on b7? Let's see how that changes the dynamics. Uh, sorry, instead of bishop g5. Rook b1, bishop takes, rook takes. Now, a rook's on b7, kind of like nice. I mean, that's nice. More importantly, we've got a big threat. Knight takes e1, and um, OK. Let's see what's going on. You can take the pawn, but then it's going to cost you your bishop. So Geller defends his pawn, uh, bishop, pardon me, rook e8. And Michael Tal says, I like, my, I like my pawn. So with this move, d6, we're still unsure. How many of you think the exchange sacrifice is justified and it's it's a good position for, for white. How many think, hey man, black didn't do anything wrong, that you know he's played all logical moves so far, so the position must be good for black. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty even. And this is a kind of a strange thing about a lot of Tall's uh, sacrifices, is that in fact, he had really superb judgment in terms of um, uh, 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 factoring in the dynamic, the, 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 the dynamic possibilities in the position. So after this move d7, d6, well, in the first place, it opens up the possibility of queen takes c4, queen takes f7 check, and checkmate on g7. Second of all, it's just kind of nice to have a pawn on d6, right? Yeah. And um, if, if we could ever play queen takes c4 and bishop b3, well, our attack against the f7 pawn is really going to be brutal. And finally, not to put too fine a point on it, because we do want to maintain this threat of knight takes e1, there even exists ideas of knight g5 and knight e5 going after the f7 pawn. But basically, with queen takes c4, with a pawn and a bishop for the exchange, um, as well as a rook on the seventh rank, white's whole attacking idea, I think, is fully justified. And for that reason, Geller played the move queen c8, not just attacking the rook on b7, but guarding his pawn on uh, c4. Now, again, at this point, I think Geller was pretty happy. Okay? Just like, you know, as the Soviet championship, um, he's an exchange ahead. It's a little bit weird. We're not 100% sure about uh, uh, White's compensation. And to my mind, Tall played an extraordinary move here. What move did Michael Tall make with the White pieces? Well, let me start you off by saying that the logical move, and the move that I think most grandmasters would play, is rook c7. Needless to say, Tal did not make this move. <laughs> Tal did not play rook c7. And I think that after rook c7, queen e6, the game would pretty much go into a draw. How did I analyze that to a draw? Um, hmm, okay. 
uh, <laughs> I had analyzed this to a draw. Now I'm not too sure how I did it. <laughs> like, like uh, scratch? Uh, what? Okay. Uh, I think I played the move knight g5. Attacking the queen. And queen to d5. I think bishop takes h7 check. King h8. Uh, how did I do this? Damn! <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I'll come to the, I'll come back to this point. <laughs> yes, young man, you had a question. Did you? Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. So you had an idea, but you 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 checked yourself. You saw the solution as well. Okay. Michael Tall played a remarkable move. Bishop g five. Whoa! I mean, he just like hangs a rook. Right? But what is it? What is it that, that it's not just courage and creativity and knowledge. What was it that, com that, that compelled Michael Tall to play this move, Bishop G5? Just thoughts. Just what do you think? How did Michael, I mean, how did Michael Tall in this position come up with this move. There's a lot of attack there. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And, and uh, what the gentleman said was that there's a lot of attackers there. And that's what oftentimes grandmasters, and I think everybody should actually just use this uh, simple formula of defenders versus the attackers, right? What's the ratio? Okay, uh, in Tall's mind, what he could see is that when the bishop comes to f6, he's got ideas of bishop takes h7 check, knight g5 check, or bishop takes f6, bishop takes check, king takes, queen comes across to h4, comes to g5, mates on g7. So. In Tall's mind, what he's seeing is he's attacking with one, two, three, four pieces. Black's defending with one, two, three, because we always count the king as a defender, right? So in Tall's mind, this move, bishop g5, is completely in this whole idea of I'm going to attack you where you're weak, where you don't have pieces. But I just think that this move, bishop g5, is just inspiring. I mean, like, bam! <laughs> you know, like, and, and you have to imagine that Geller's reaction must have been like, you know, just blind shock. <laughs> like, like, what's this? You know, he didn't move his rook, <laughs> he doesn't move this rook, and. Uh, there's nothing that can throw you off so much as an unexpected move. And it's not just psycho psychological, but in reality, it's much harder to defend than it is to attack, right? I mean, attacking, uh, you might find yourself having a possibility that leads to a forced perpetual check, so you can bail out, or you might find a uh, possibility of sacrificing more, uh, but with the idea of winning. Uh, whereas the defender, you might just only have this very narrow path where you have to play only moves. So after um, bishop g5, Geller decided not to take the rook, not to take the rook, but instead tried to impose, I mean, his own threat. I mean, 
he's getting pushed around pretty good, right? So now he's trying to come back with this move, rook e2 with a double attack against the bishop on c2 and threaten to take this pawn on f2, forking the queen and the king. But let's see uh, whether this coffee house attack by Tal would have, what would have happened if he takes his rook? Okay, so bishop takes f6, and now we're threatening to win on the spot. For example, I'll just toss a move out just to show um, what kind of threats white has in the position. Check, check. Queen here, threatening checkmate, and it's that simple. You get mated on the dark squares. Uh, either white will play queen here checkmate or queen here checkmate. Okay, so uh, let's imagine that black captures the bishop on f6. Now remember this little pawn that had been back here on the d5 square. And from on the d5 square when it was here, like there was a knight takes, there was a bishop takes, or there was a queen takes the pawn. Now this little pawn on d6, do we notice what it does in the position? It guards the square e7. Guards the square e7. What do I mean by that? Well, how can white get at black's king? What's a real good move? Do you see the really good move? Like, if we take a look at this bishop on c2, it attacks the pawn on h7. So if we could put our queen on h7 with a check, the king would go here, we could go checkmate, because the king can't escape. So, we'd have queen h4, correct? With the idea of taking this pawn. Black's only move would be uh, king f8 would allow us to go queen check, king, queen takes check. Ah, yeah. I think the only move is f5, correct? Okay. So this is, uh, this is very, very often I see this in uh, Tall's games that he always has a draw, right? So like in this position, if there's not a win, you can see that white has a perpetual check, right? So suddenly white realizes that he's not taking a risk. So when you're playing and attacking and you can see that you have a forced perpetual check, this is a really, really big plus for you, right? Because you know you're not taking any risk and maybe, just maybe, uh, there's more than a perpetual check. How many of you think there's more than a perpetual check? <laughs> and in fact, there is more than a perpetual check. Uh, I think the correct way, gosh, it's been a while since I've seen this, was queen g5 check, king here. I think we're supposed to go here. Does this make sense? King here, and we're supposed to go bishop takes. And if, I th if I've done it right, I think that this is the winning idea, is to be able to play knight g5 and not allow f7, f6 uh, uh, by black. In other words, if we go back to this moment, it, it may seem correct just to play bishop takes f5 to once again threaten to capture this pawn on h7 here, but this allows the defense f7, f6, and, w and the queen defends h7. So that was why 
we made that little queen move instead so that f7, f6 isn't playable, and now we play bishop takes f5. OK, so we go back, and bishop g5 comes, and now rook e2. OK, so sports fans, what did Michael Tal play? <laughs> Don't all shout at once. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, bishop takes f6 allows black to, uh, <laughs> so it was a dual threat. The move rook, 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 rook here had the dual threat. Well, we, well let's, let's start with the elimination. Knight takes, rook takes, king h2, queen takes b7. Can't be good for, for, for white, because in the first place, we've just traded off one of our attackers, so that variation we saw a moment ago is not is no longer possible. The knight's been removed. So knight takes is out. Uh, one idea we might consider is d7, right? d7 is a kind of an intriguing move. Um, let's see what other ideas. And the other idea is simply in this position. Now we protect our rook. After the move rook c7, bishop takes f2 check as a threat. We'll take, take, take the queen, take the rook, and we'll be material ahead. We'll have two pieces for a rook. Queen e6, knight takes, rook takes, king here. And now, and now, even though the combination is still ongoing, we start to sum things up. First of all, white has a pawn and two bishops uh, against the rook knight. Um, still a good attacking potential. Uh, bishop takes f6, d7 ideas are in the position. And unfortunately, at this moment, um, well, no, this move is fine. Rook d8 was a good move. But now, after bishop takes f6, Geller probably in time trouble, because Ge F.M. Geller was a, <laughs> was a notorious time trouble addict. Um, here he, he blundered and lost. I, I had analyzed something like queen takes f6, Queen takes f6, g takes f6, d7, king f8, bishop takes rook here, I think. I think this is right. King g3, rook takes bishop f5. And I actually like this ending for white. In the first place, this pawn on d7 and this bishop on f5 combination really is worth this rook on d8. Secondly, this rook being behind the passed pawn on c4, we can play rook here, king e7, and rook takes whenever we want, like. And in the meanwhile, this pawn also is quite dangerous for black. So I thought that this position was better for white, or rather white has the sunny side of, of uh, maybe a drawish position. But nonetheless, uh, Geller should have played that. Instead, Geller played g takes uh, f6. And this is a blunder y. What can, what can Michael, yes young man. It does. 
It does. That's exactly right. It does leave his king open, but black's pieces are poised for a skewer. And we all know what a skewer is. Right, Jillian? So we skewer by, yes, rookie seven, and black loses a piece. Of course, Geller saw the move rook e7, and he understood that he can't move his queen because rook takes rook wins for white. But what he anticipated was that he was going to take the rook, you right, so that after takes, rook takes, and it's black who wins brilliantly. Yes? But here, he suddenly had a realization that white has a swizzenzug. Do you know what the word swizzenzug means? It's a German word. It means in between. And a moment ago, you said that this move opens up black's king, which it does. White would move his queen with check, and only after the queen has moved with check, the king is moving. Now we can take the queen and we win. Yeah? Sweet. So this is how the game finished. It, uh, white is a piece ahead, of course, and he wins quite soon, resigns. Nice, huh? Nice game. Nice game. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh boy, that almost takes us to the end of our lecture. Uh, uh, for, the next, uh, for the next lecture coming up after this, I'm actually going to use another game of Michael Tall. Uh, and he played one of the most extraordinary moves of all time. I mean, <laughs> I promise you, if you guess the move, <laughs> you could be a future world champion. Mm -hmm.